Hi, welcome back for part two of solving tone problems in conjunction with the Saxophone Pedagogy book of Ray Smith. This is, um, I'm going to use tenor to illustrate this because it seems like I'm always fighting this. I fight it with everybody, all players of all the saxophones, but it's particularly more noticeable, I think, on tenor a lot of times. Uh, so a student will come in and they'll be playing a sound something like this. When I would rather hear this. In other words, there's a lighter version of the sound and there's a heavier version of the sound. That first one is a heavier, in my mind, it's a little more open and heavy. Whereas this is going to be much lighter. I mean, it's a much nicer sound, much more pleasant sound in my mind. What is it? <clears throat> it's simply focusing in smaller. Tighten up the strings on the drawstring a little bit. <sighs> Speed up the air just a little bit. Lighten up. It's, it's going to have a much more pleasant sound to it than if you uh, play that more, I think it almost sounds blatty or honky. No. Plus, as I mentioned in the vibrato chapter, if you're playing with that more light, crisp, clear sound, the vibrato has less room to get in a, into trouble. The vibrato is going to sound a lot nicer and more pleasant. Uh, maybe that's enough on that. Uh, here's another issue that we are always finding that when we play louder, it tends to get brighter. <laughs> Getting brighter. Well, I've got to take off the edge of my oral cavity and bring it down a little bit. Bright. <laughs> you know, when I play my wind controller, <clears throat> there are a lot of the uh, Synth boxes are, are based now on what they call physical modeling, where they're modeling what the synth does after real instruments. So when you crescendo, it gets brighter. Say, no, 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 it's not supposed to get brighter when you crescendo. Well, that's what you do, so that's what we model. No, we're trying not to do that. <laughs> and sometimes I use that uh, to illustrate the point when I'm teaching, but I don't want a brighter sound. I want it to be a little more dark. And so if I'm playing, the louder I play, the more I have to open and deepen and take the edge off the sound. Never want it to get raucous and harsh. Uh, let me illustrate another uh, principle. Um, you notice I'm clearing the read a lot. I do that. But you know, if you're in a performance, you can't do that. And a few years ago, I had Eugene Rousseau come and play at my school and did an hour and a half re uh, recital. Beautiful. Uh, just marvelous playing. The next day, I had him with my students in a master class, and the student, one of the students, raised his hand and said, "Whenever I play classical saxophone, I tend to get a lot of spit in the reed. I'm always having to clear the reed and suck it out." He said, "Last night you played an hour and a half." He said this to Rousseau. You played an hour and a half, and you never cleared the reed once. How do you do that? Rousseau said, "Oh, I cleared the reed at least 150 times during that recital." He said, but I've developed a way that's quiet to do it. And he compared it to sick, thick, <laughs> sucking a thick chocolate malt through a straw. I can do this without extra noise. I've had to practice a little bit, but it's like, and it'll clear out the tip of the reed so we don't have all that spit rumbling around in there and we keep our, our sound clear. The worst is when you've got spit in that sound. Uh, we want that really clear, digital, pristine, clean sound. So uh, part of that is keeping the reed cleared out, 
We don't seem to have so much trouble with that in the Jazz, maybe because the tip opening is wider, maybe because we're gutting it harder and we're just blowing it on through, and maybe because we don't care that much if we get a little bit of extra grit in the sound, but we do care about that a lot in our classical playing. And so we've got to keep it quiet, and that's just a little tip on clearing the reed. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about playing low notes. How do I get that note to speak like that? Well, I did a couple of things. First of all, I took, I pulled the swing back. <sighs> I have the image that I pull the swing back and push. And we've got a lot more momentum, natural weight in the air, than if I just pull the swing back. Uh, so when, is it, when we go to the low notes, there are several things that we have to think of. I took a quick break to change to alto. I think I'm going to illustrate these next things on alto because I want to show... I've got a setup set up already for my jazz alto and classical. I want to deal with classical jazz tone, but let me deal with another couple of issues. Uh, uh, let's deal with low notes, uh, dealing with uh, trying to get low notes to attack or trying to get them to speak. And there's several things that we need to realize about this. First of all, when I go down, the tube is only as long as to the first open hole. And if I'm fingering B, the tube is only this long. Now, if I finger D, the first open hole is clear down here. Look how much longer it is. How many cubic centimeters of air displacement is that? I mean, that's a that's a lot of difference. Uh, that's a lot of difference. And I, I've got to add more air for low notes. Uh, if I don't add more air, I won't have enough air to speak. So I've got to add more air, but if I add more air right when I need it, then it sounds like I pounced on the note and punched it out. I don't want that. So I'm going to actually crescendo in my upper note. So it sounds natural to get to the low note without, it doesn't sound like I pounded it. Plus, I want to be sure that the note after the low note also has more air so that it doesn't sound, that'll also help to, if the note before and the note after are both are the same strength, it won't sound like I punched the note out so much. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other things. I have to add a little bit more air to play low. Besides needing a little bit more air, uh, I also need to be sure that my embouchure doesn't loosen. If I go, I'm dropping away the support that the reed needs to vibrate. I actually push the jaw slightly forward so I can give a little bit more into the reed without choking. It's a similar concept to altissimo where I need to give a little more pressure. Uh, we push the jaw forward so we're in a harder part of the reed so we don't choke it. I'm going to do the same thing with the low notes, believe it or not. By putting the jaw forward, I've got a little bit more uh, support to the reed and it'll help it vibrate more. The other thing that has to happen is the low note throat. Oh, oh. There's no reason to wait until it's time to play the low note to do that. I can put that on the upper note. It doesn't hurt the upper note at all to have better oral cavity. So now I've done, I'm doing three things at this moment. I'm pushing the jaw slightly forward and firming up just a little bit as I go to the low note. And I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating that. I'm starting to do that already on the upper note before I even try to go there. I'm having the low note prepared for the low throat, uh, the, the low throat prepared for the low note. And I'm doing that also a little bit in advance. Don't wait till it's time to do it. And then I'm adding a little bit of air on that again. I'm preparing that ahead of time so that when I get to the note, it speaks. Uh, <clears throat> Little adage here that I'll probably mention more than once, but uh, if I can keep a high note throat all over the horn and a low note throat all over the horn, then I can go anywhere on the horn. I've got a lot more flexibility of popping up and down over intervals and so on and having a note speak. Uh, the worst enemy that we have, and I have to fight this all the time with students, is dropping the jaw to play low notes. That is the worst idea, but somehow, intuitively, we all think we should do it. I'm here to tell you that's wrong. Uh, I'll never forget when I heard Rousseau.
just speaking pretty fast. I was like, wow, he did it better than I just did. But uh, how in the world can you do it on the saxophone? You do it by not changing your embouchure. You cannot loosen and expect those notes to come out because you drop away the support the reed needs right at the moment you want it to speak. It doesn't work. Uh, <clears throat> so the other thing that I would do to play the low notes is Rousseau used to say, grab it. Those are big keys down here. So I'm going to a low note. Grab it. Don't give it a reason to back up on you. That was mostly coming because my hand was just sluggishly going down. And then, the, and then by the time it could have spoken, it, has, it hasn't spoken, and then I'm in trouble. So those are some things that I put into playing low notes. While we're talking about all this, we need to talk about slurring down. Slurring down is a difficult thing. I alluded to it a minute ago, actually, especially if you're slurring down in the same overtone series. I've got to get that to speak quickly like that. That's in the same uh, same overtone series. That doesn't just happen. Well, what is the key to that? Again, keep a high note embouchure, low note throat, air constant, and get your thumb out of the way. <laughs> Uh, the thumb the thumb has got to get out of the way quicker because it goes through a lot of all that extra linkage that it has to go through here and determine which octave key will open and there's just quite a lot of linkage here there's a little delay there that isn't in the if i just push down the first finger key i'm not going to have that delay but there's a little delay to all that octave key linkage so i have to anticipate that a little bit so if i'm slurring down let's say i'm going from e down to g sharp this is a challenging interval now, if I loosen, it'll either scoop, it'll either scoop or it won't speak. There's the scoop, or if I can keep my embouchure firm, I've got a chance. Then I've got to have the low note throat for the lower note. I'll keep that on the upper note. So I'm keeping a high note embouchure, a low note throat, and then I'm keeping my air constant. The other thing I'm doing is I'm getting my octave key off quick. Now if I'm holding the E, I took off the octave key, there's still a little delay before it tries to go down. Finally it's going to go down. There's no reason not to get it out of the way fairly early then so that it doesn't factor into the equation. Because of that sluggishness in the linkage, if I let go at the exact moment I need it, it won't close on time. It will be sluggish, it'll be late. So I start ahead of time. The other thing I do, I didn't do it right there, is I put the G sharp key down on the E. That takes one of the variables out of the equation. That's really the whole secret to this thing, is do not drop your jaw. Keep the upper embouchure, the upper, the focus of a, of a high note embouchure all over the horn. Do you know that John Coltrane used to practice with no octave key in the upper register, and then with the octave key in the low register? Playing with no octave key in your high notes makes you focus nicely. Playing with octave key in the low notes makes you really open or else it'll go up the octave. And so the two, Getting, it really did the same thing, I think, that we're talking about. It got in really focused here and really open here. That's the whole secret to getting everything to pop around, doing those hard slurs down. That's what it takes to do that. So if I was to uh, summarize that, for slurring down, take off your octave key early. Two, have your high note embouchure constant, do not drop your jaw. Three, have your low note throat already ready on the upper register, so you go there and you're ready for the low note throat to voice properly. And four, if there's a chance to uh, put the G-sharp key down early, do that. And, uh, and then if it's necessary for a lower note, add a little bit of air to it as you go down, as we talked about before in the low notes. So those are some keys to, to slurring down, which is a very difficult thing to do on the saxophone. I think we talked about everything pretty much. Oh, classical versus jazz tone. We're dealing with a chapter with how to make that difference between jazz tone and classical tone. Let me just give her a, a few thoughts on that. In the classical tone, I'm nicely focused. I'm playing with a 
a little colder airstream, I think. If I get too open here or too, too slow in the air. Start getting that husky, fat sound, a little bit on the saggy side. I hate that sound. No. So I'm focusing up pretty clear sound, you know. Most of the things I think that between classical and jazz sound are more, more in the idea of what inflections I'm using, how I'm using vibrato, a lot of the stylistic things. But I think there is this difference, fundamental difference in how we're doing tone. I don't feel like I'm using any different embouchure or any different anything really, except in the fine adjustments, I think my is, I pulled in the strings a little bit more. I'm a little bit more focused around the mouthpiece. I think I've fine tuned just a little bit colder air stream and so on. Let me, let me change to the jazz mouthpiece. On this mouthpiece, I'm gonna open up a little bit more. I'm gonna play deep. We talked about this in the, earlier in the, the first video for the chapter. I'm gonna play deep. Remember, play down, f play five cents flatter. I think that's gonna be a little bit, slightly warmer airstream. I'm gonna be a little bit deeper in the pitch. And I'm, that means that when I'm blowing that hard, that I've got my embouchure has to respond to the size of the airstream by being just a little bit larger. It's not going to be reined in quite as tight. It's it's. Um, you know, I'm gutting it quite a bit. I'm blowing fairly strong. I'm playing also more percussively. As far as style, I'm playing a lot more percussively, less punchy when I do the classical stuff, more punchy when I do the jazz stuff. Uh, I think really, other than mostly stylistic things, it's that idea that I'm a little more open blowing, a little bit deeper in the pitch and, and playing stronger. I mean, I can play very loud. You heard me do it a while ago on the classical mouthpiece, but it's a different approach. I'm not just opening up and letting it. I'm not trying to play all the time five, you know, like 10 cents or 15 cents flatter. By the way, if you do that and it makes you flat, then what do you do? Push your mouthpiece in. Don't let it make you flat, but blow deep for the jazz. And I think that's probably the biggest difference. The other really big difference, of course, is I'm making a mouthpiece change. I've got a more open mouthpiece tip and I might have a different chamber. I'm gonna have a lot more, um, I've got more capacity to put more air through this mouthpiece because the tip opening is wider. Um, so I think for making the difference between classical tone and jazz tone, let me just summarize that. Classical mouthpiece for the classical tone, jazz mouthpiece for the jazz tone. Classical tone, focus the embouchure, pull the drawstring, pull it in and focus a little bit firmer, smaller, lighter. Jazz, you're gonna have to open a little bit more to accommodate all the air that's going through. Classical, I'm going to direct up a little bit more. I'm going to play a little bit higher in the pitch range, probably. Not, I'm not like clarinet, but I'm, going to, I'm not going to go way deep, quite as deep as I do on, the, on that jazz either, I don't think. And I'm going to, um, on the jazz mouthpiece, I'm going to blow deep and as deep as I can without crossing over into that saggy territory. And then, you know, I'm just going to generally play stronger. I think most of the other things are... You know, the percussiveness is a stylistic thing. The vibrato use, the inflections, scooping, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, all the effects. Classical, we're hitting dead on a pitch. Jazz, we often scoop. You know, there's a lot of little stylistic things. But I don't think there's that much difference, actually, between playing. I mean, I don't think of any major difference, no fundamental difference in the embouchure. But there is a little difference in the size of it, I think. And I think there's a little bit of difference in the size of how I focus in the oral cavity. So uh, I think that's how I would sum that up. I believe that I've hit pretty much all the stuff uh, that we did in the chapter with the things that I want to demonstrate in sound. So let's take a break and I'm going to come back and do a third part for this chapter on what if the read's the problem? <laughs> and what are some of the things that we can do with the read? So let's take a little break. I'll be back in a few minutes with the read. Thank you.